Are you prepared you? to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you discussion can't, can you? you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We're with you live from 1 until 3 every weekday. Coming up this afternoon, Dame Esther Ransom's dying wish. The forecaster says she will go to Dignitas if her treatment for stage 4 lung cancer is unsuccessful. Meanwhile, Michelle Moan hits back the disgraced peer who lied to the press about her links to a PPE firm, insists that Rishi Sunak knew about her involvement. And new school rules. Teachers will be banned from letting kids change their gender if their parents say no. That's under new trans guidance that promises to put parents first. But ministers warn it must be made into law as schools threaten to flout it. All of that is coming up, but first, let's get the news headlines with Nadira Tudor. Good afternoon. Residents in Iceland have described the crazy and scary scenes after a volcanic eruption overnight. 4,000 people have been evacuated from their homes after lava began spilling from a two-mile crack close to the Blue Lagoon. Homes and businesses in its path have been destroyed. It's not expected to bring the same level of disruption as the one in 2010, which halted European air travel. But experts say this eruption has a surprising pattern and should last for some time. It is impossible right now um, to establish uh, how long it is going to be uh, the eruption, uh, but comparing with the east, previous history of uh, Icelandic eruption, realistically it is going to last uh, no more than a few months. At least 126 people have died in China and hundreds injured in one of the country's deadliest earthquakes in years. The 6.2 magnitude quake struck the mountainous northwest early this morning and emergency crews are facing sub-zero temperatures as they scour the wreckage. The government's published its long-awaited non-statutory transgender guidance for schools and colleges in England, which recommends a parent-first approach. It says schools do not have to and should not accept all requests for social transition and don't have to address pupils in chosen pronouns. It also says single-sex spaces must be protected. Ten Tory MPs have written to the Foreign Secretary demanding the government backs an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Lord David Cameron is visiting Paris and Rome in a diplomatic push to lobby for unity in the European approach to the Israel-Hamas war. Former Royal Navy and NATO commander Chris Parry told Talk TV a ceasefire won't work. Well, a sustainable uh, ceasefire is a platitude. Um, I think everybody knows that actually any ceasefire is bound to be broken in the current circumstances. And it's a way of, I think, mitigating criticism that uh, we're not doing enough to restrain what is perceived as something Israel is doing in Gaza. Meanwhile, the UK has joined a new international naval task force to combat attacks on ships in the Red Sea from fighters who support Hamas. Companies, including BP, have started avoiding the area because Houthi rebels in Yemen have been targeting vessels they think are bound for Israel. Analysts are warning attacks on commercial ships risk pushing up the price of oil and other goods. And Dame Esther Ranson says she's considering the option of assisted dying if her lung cancer treatment does not improve her condition. The 83-year-old Childline founder and broadcaster has revealed she's joined the Swiss clinic Dignitas and is calling for a vote on the legality of assisted dying. It's currently illegal in the UK and is punishable by up to 14 years in prison. That's the latest now for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello. It was a wet start across many parts of England and Wales this morning. You can see it on the earlier satellite and radar picture. Uh, lots of rain, particularly heavy across parts of the west. But a lot of that rain is now clearing away down southeastwards, allowing for much drier and sunnier conditions for England and Wales this afternoon. On the other hand, Scotland and Northern Ireland will continue with sunny spells, but there will also be blustery showers across these areas. A few of them may also reach parts of the northwest of England. And it's going to be feeling cooler as the day progresses as that rain clears top temperatures up into the high single figures, so 8 or 9 degrees Celsius. Now, overnight, we'll continue with the rash of showers from the northwest. Winds will become uh, stronger through the night as well across northern areas. Further south, though, I think we will see mostly dry conditions with long, clear spells and lighter winds. It will be a cool night for everywhere, especially across rural spots of Scotland. Then for tomorrow, yes, lots of sunshine to begin the day, but already blustery showers across the northwest. Then another area of rain pushing its way southwards through the day across much of Scotland, Northern Ireland, northern parts of England and Wales. So rather cloudy and damp affair across these areas drier in the south but cloudy as well. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. We have lots coming up over the next few hours, including Dame Esther Ranson's dying wish, Michelle Moon doubling down in her row with Rishi Sunak, and the EU introducing stricter border rules for Brits. And today we're joined in the studio by Rebecca Ryan, campaign director at Defund the BBC. Uh, welcome, Rebecca. Always a pleasure. Um, now, uh, before we get to the uh, important business mm. of the day, another busy this news This was day. important business uh, the, Well, of the yeah, day. well, you, when you're on telly a bit, you get, you know, get viewers and, uh, I use the term loosely, fans. Uh, <laughs> they send you in uh, Christmas cards and letters. So we've had a few Christmas cards. Yeah, it's nice. Anyway, uh, this is the kind of uh, mail that we get. So tell us what your Christmas card said. Mine said something like, Dear Alex, have a very Merry Christmas. From James Toner in Glasgow yeah. in Scotland. Hi, James. Yeah. And then underneath here, taking the time to do a big pink heart, and in the middle it said, you're hot. Uh, and I got one uh, from a guy whose name I forget, and I, I did promise... And he them. asked to I know, well, it's in my case, which is on the Hold other on. side I of the I took a city. photo of it. I, 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 if you get, you get that I'll, up. I'll get anyway, it, I'll take a photo. Have you got it? Well done, anyway, give me a moment. Anyway, to cut a long story short, we'll, we'll give you a name check in a minute, although I'm not sure why. Uh, <laughs> what this guy said, he said, yeah, thank you, Kevin, yeah, I love your stuff, you're great on, the, on Talk TV. You are the Keith Richards of, T of Talk TV. You are the Keith Richards. I mean, Richards. is that a compliment? <laughs> what does it mean? You know, I don't know what it says. It says, on the great go. shows you do with Alex, I watch every day. You are the Keith Richards of Talk TV. <laughs> Alex has a lovely smile. Yeah, and what's his me name? A I don't know, I only took that. That. Oh, no. that photo, uh, that one. And I then, then it was most importantly, it says, P.S. I hate woke. Yeah, well, well we're with you there. <laughs> and I'm going to get look your name up, and I will, promise I will name check you tomorrow. Uh, but thank you for the card. Thank you for the uh, compliment. Uh, Kit, what does he think? That I'm like kind of 80 years old and they take a lot of drugs. <laughs> I am not 80 <laughs> years old. Uh, <laughs> Um, oh. uh, right, more serious. Well, I mean, to be we, honest, you need to take a lot of drugs with that horrible cold you've got. Yeah. I'm, just, I'm trying to sit as far <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. away from him as possible. Uh, He's rattling. Uh, now, Rebecca, would it, 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 we've got a story today that uh, NHS dentistry has basically collapsed. Yeah. Nobody can get to see a dentist on the NHS. Uh, would you, uh, like some people, quite a few people, have had to resort to pulling their own teeth out? Would you do that? I have to tell you, my, my worst recurring nightmare is, is teeth falling out. I cannot watch yeah. teeth being pulled out or anything like that. That's my, yeah, my worst. No, so that's I, a no. I, I, don't, I wouldn't go oh. near it, no. But I mean, no. it is. To I'd be pay safe. good money to have it taken out properly. Yeah. I wouldn't, yeah. Yeah, but people, that. that's the point. Yeah, okay, well, you'd you have to go private. Yeah. Yeah. These are people uh, who, you know, they, they can't afford to go yeah. private. And there, the there are stories that people are waiting two years. Uh, for an appointment to go that, to go to the dentist. I've got a toothache. Yeah, come in uh, 2026. <laughs> I mean, that's no good. So people in desperation are pulling their own teeth oh, out. No. Uh, we're hoping to talk to one such person later in the oh. show. But what a thing. What a I thing. I know. Do you know, I'm really funny about this. I remember my mum telling me from a young age, look after your teeth, because when you get your adult set, that is the only <laughs> set of teeth you get. And dentistry costs a lot of money. So I've made it almost to the grand old age of 40 without 
anything, you, no feelings. You, you actually nothing. brush your teeth about 23 times yeah. a day. Yeah, Kevin you? often sees me scuttling. I come in in the morning. <laughs> I, I do. Teeth. I come in in the morning before we go on air. I brush my teeth, and then like just before I come on air now, I brush my teeth. So I usually rack up about four brushings a day. I, ke I keep my teeth very clean. I, I take them out of the glass every morning, space. and then I put them in. There. <laughs> No, 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 these are my own teeth, all my own teeth and all my own lies. Um, uh, yeah, so a busy show uh, coming up uh, and uh, we will also uh, be talking about Michelle Moen. What's your take on uh, Baroness Bra, uh, Rebecca? Well, I think, you know, how can people in government say that they didn't know that that was what was happening? You know, this is the thing which I find so sort of shocking. It's that, of course, that's what happened is that she used her sort of... Her they called them the VIP audio. lanes. Exactly. VIP lanes they gave, a direct gave, gave call a VIPs out. a direct yeah. line into the government exactly. to uh, say, I can get you PPE. Yeah. Uh, and uh, by the way, the government then went on to pay way over the odds yeah. for everything. <laughs> and uh, uh, they have writ they have written off, and I and I do not lie, 15 billion quid's worth of money that they just gave oh, away, basically, to the crooks. The COVID fraud. Uh, and change. also, by the way, we're going to be starting the show far more seriously. We're mm. going to be starting the show uh, interviewing um, um, Esther Ranson's daughter. Now, Esther Ranson is reserving the right to die. Uh, she's talking about going to Dignitas. She's got lung cancer. And I think she should have every right to do yeah, so, don't you? Yeah, it's a really important topic of conversation. We've had a similar situation in my own family where um, I understand there were discussions about this. If someone's got a really chronic illness or a lifelong disability, it's only going to get worse. And they're going to suffer it's about dignity. In, their, in their dying years. Then, yeah, I mean, you know, should we? Yeah. Basically, well, listen, we're going to be we're going to be covering this in just a little while, talking to Esther's daughter Rebecca. So, looking mm. forward to that very important story. And we are asking you today: Should we have the right to choose to end our own lives? Give us a call: o three four 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 nine nine one thousand, or you can text us. Uh, don't forget to write "talk" in your message and send it to eight seven two two two, or you can tweet us on X at Talk TV. You didn't do all your things Well, no, there. it's a sort of sombre topic no, of is, conversation. Is, is. So I didn't feel like I wanted to see myself. You're absolutely like right. So, uh, two hours top story now. And Dame Esther Ransom has said she would consider ending her life through assisted dying as she battles stage four lung cancer. The veteran broadcaster revealed she's joined the Swiss clinic Dignitas and will consider going there if her upcoming scan shows her condition is getting worse. If you watch someone you love having a bad death, that memory obliterates all the happy times. And I don't want that to happen. Mm. I don't want, you know, to be that sort of victim in their lives. I think I would get them to do a free vote on assisted dying. I think it's important that the law catches up with what the country wants. Well, assisted suicide is banned in England, Wales and Northern Ireland with a maximum prison sentence of 14 years. But Dame Esther says people should be given the choice about how and when they want to die. Well, joining us now is Dame Esther Ranson's daughter, Rebecca Wilcox. Rebecca, thank you so much for coming on to discuss this really important topic of conversation. How did your mum address this with you? Is it something that you've had a conversation about as a family or did she say to you, this is what I want? And how did you feel about that? Well, um, if you've met my mum, she doesn't come to decisions lightly and she doesn't change her mind. So by the time we heard about it, it was intractable law in our house. So she has done a documentary, she's written books, she's done articles um, about how to have a good death. And actually cancer came out relatively okay in terms of pain management and keeping your faculties. Obviously there are different types of cancer and different ways to go. But she has always said that she wants to have a dignified life and a dignified death. And the process of dying replaces and supersedes your family's memories if it's a terrible death. And I know that when my father died, all we thought about for years were those last seconds, those last moments when it was tubes, there was blood, there was beeping, there were nurses, there were doctors, there was a lot of crying. And that's all all I could remember of my father for so long. And mum has had such a life, such a legacy, even as a mother, let alone as the campaigner broadcaster that um, she's known as. So 
just to remember her in pain and unhappy would be awful, uh, a waste, such a waste. The death of uh, your mother, uh, your redoubtable mother, uh, venerable mother, uh, Rebecca, uh, will not only, of course, be a great tragedy for you, but it will be a tragedy for the nation. Uh, and I think this is about dignity. Uh, I'm sure you followed the story of uh, another dame, Dame uh, Diana Rigg, who her daughter recently released tapes that uh, Diana recorded just before her very undignified death. And uh, Diana basically said, why do I have to go through this? Uh, I'm not going to go into the details, but you know what I'm talking about. This is about dignity, and I find it extraordinary that th these are our bodies. We should be able to make these decisions. We're adults, and yet a bunch of politicians decide, no, 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 in this respect, we're in charge of your bodies, and you can't do that. That's against the law. We hereby sentence you or your relatives to 14 years in prison for taking them to Switzerland to go to Dignitas. That is just... It's just an anachronism. It's absurd, is it not? We do so many brilliant things in this country. I think palliative care and the NHS, obviously, I'm not the only person or the first person to ever say this, but they are brilliant heroes and geniuses. But... The fact that we make laws based on disasters and they are reactionary, so the Dangerous Dogs Act, for instance, it's looking at the worst case scenario. And yes, there are evil people out there who would abuse a law to allow uh, assisted dying to get whatever they wanted to get from the person that was dying if they were vulnerable. But they are a few. And when mum did the documentary How to Have a Good Death, there was a survey and it was Without a shadow of a doubt, everybody said that you should be allowed to choose how you die. So why don't we protect and take precautions to stop the nefarious view, as it were, but also allow people to go gently, to have the death they want? I mean, I have two young children, and when it came to the process of giving birth, I was given every option. I wrote out a very detailed birth plan. I spoke with many doctors and midwives. And I think the same process and the same consideration and the same respect should be applied to death, that we should have conversations, that you should have a midwife for death, as it were, or a death doula, if you want. And that will make everybody more aware of what happens. And I think power comes from knowledge in this situation. If you know what's about to happen and you are able to tell your loved ones what you want and you write out a birth plan stroke death plan, why shouldn't that be enacted? That's your wish. It is your wish to take the medicine that prolongs your life. Why aren't you allowed to take the medicine that ends your life? Absolutely. The, the difficulty, of course, that um, you and your family might face is uh, if your mother were to choose to, uh, in her words, buzz off to Zurich, <laughs> um, it puts you in a difficult position about whether or not you can go with her because that would leave you uh, at the mercy of whether the police would then want to prosecute you for potentially assisting her. Is that something else you've sort of worked around and figured out how you might do that? It's impossible, isn't it? Because I can't even say to you I would support Mum on her journey to Dignitas because... If I said that, that's legally murky. I mean, uh, obviously in my head, I would have thought that I would never let her go alone to somewhere like that, but I'm a busy working mum. I can't leave my children to pop off to jail while she's buzzing off to Switzerland. So the fact is only three people a year get prosecuted, but the actual process of going through a court case and what is the worst time of my life so far, you know, mum is my person. I do not want to live without her. I will have to live without her. And please, please don't make it worse for me by accusing me of murdering her and making me go through what would be a terrifying legal process. That, Rebecca, is the other absurdity uh, of this saga, is that when people do assist their loved ones in uh, taking their own lives, and don't forget, it's not always at Dignitas, uh, people do it here. Invariably, the courts uh, take the humane decision. You know, they don't sort of say, all right, you get 14 years, you can't do that. They understand, and we all understand. So you have a bunch of politicians in Parliament banning this, you know, saying, well, no, we have control of your bodies, not you. Uh, so uh, ridiculously 
people who help their nearest and dearest, people they've been married to for 50 years to take their own life, end up in court. And the courts, of course, turn around and say, you're not a murderer, you know, off you go, uh, sorry for your loss. So once again, the whole system is ridiculous. Now, your mother's, uh, I hate to put it this way, uh, uh, shall we say, not quite dying wish, her wish, uh, is that she said if she was Prime Minister for the day, she'd allow a free vote in Parliament. And uh, surely, if that was allowed, uh, MPs would come to the right decision and allow people to make the adult, mature decision that it is time for them to go. If only, as your mother has stipulated, and you know from your dad as well, uh, to spare their families the, the horrors of those last moments. Well... I know that my friends who, I mean, I'm in that sandwich generation where we have kids and we have parents and they may or may not be ailing. Or, and my friends who have parents who are going through dementia, some of them quite advanced, it is the worst thing in the world to watch them. And from what they tell me, I wouldn't swap places with them for love nor money. And they, one of my friend's um, mother asks to die every single visit repeatedly over and over and over doesn't really say anything else what what kindness is it to let her live i have this sounds like a strange segue but i have a very very old horse who is adorable and had a very good life and he's over 30 which for a horse is pretty good innings the vet has said he may not make another winter we might have to euthanize him and that is standard that is par for the course i would be inhumane if I didn't do that, and yet we don't apply the same rationale to people. To look at a country where they have introduced assisted dying, there have been some criticisms of the system there, and that is in Canada, where mm -hmm. there are a number of people campaigning against it who say that since it's been introduced, increasingly they feel that people are being pressurised to begin oh. down, embark, let's say, down a pathway to death, and that there are unscrupulous companies who see a commercial opportunity will offer the service and make money from it and in some respects therefore sort of using means and encouragement that might persuade people who perhaps otherwise should be seeing out more months with their family uh, the difficulty of course uh, in making it legal is then having to build one would assume a regulatory framework around it well, why is that a bad thing? If we're going to do this, I'm sorry, you may be able to hear my delightful children who are on Christmas holidays. <laughs> and they're slightly bored in the background. I'm hoping they're not um, using too many weapons against each other. They'll only be Nerf guns. <laughs> but why would it be a problem to set up regulation around this? We have regulation around everything. The um, I've been trying to adopt a dog and the forms and licenses and things that go through that is ridiculous. So. Death and birth are possibly the most important moments in your life. And I say that as someone who has um, got married and loves my husband very much, but my death, I want it to be exactly how I want it to be. And I think coming together, making a law, making structures, making regulation that respects my opinion on my body and my death, for everybody is the only sane way. It would, it would stop the money makers who want to make money from people's deaths. And frankly, um, you know, if you're gonna give someone a good death, make some money out of it. I, as long as you're helping them. I have to say, Dignitas does not look like a very lovely place. I would much rather um, have diamonds and champagnes and a hot bathtub. Um, and it doesn't look like they supply that. And I think mum would too. We both model ourselves on Dame Joan Collins, who was fat. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's funny you said about uh, animals and your horse. Uh, we were talking in the office earlier. I've had dogs all my life and, uh, you know, I've had to make that decision, you know, quite a few times now that this poor creature, it's time to put him or her out of their misery. And, you know, it's, it's heartbreaking. But at that moment, you, you, you realise, you know, we made the right decision here. We, we did the right thing. And, and, and the fact that we can do that for animals, 
uh, and, and not people it just strikes me as absurd. And in terms of people who say, oh, well, if we make this legal, then everybody will start pressurising old people into doing it or sick people into doing it, I think the chances of that are so infinitesimal that we should not let that be a blockade to common sense and allow this. Uh, so can I... Uh, that said, that's me talking, uh, so uh, you're looking forward to Christmas. What will you and uh, Esther be doing? So I have uh, exploded Christmas all over my house. I don't know whether you can see it. I wrestled from the loft mum's 1970s uh, decorations, most of which fell apart in a shower of moth wings and possibly very noxious dust. But um, I've put them everywhere. I've decorated um, her rooms. I've decorated where she is. She is hopefully going to come to us. I have possibly three turkeys. I mean, I've gone overboard like you wouldn't believe, especially as I'm an agnostic Jew. But I think this, <laughs> this is the Christmas. I have, I have said that Santa and the elf on the shelf are definitely here for this year, so nobody is allowed to say anything otherwise to my family, please. And um, magic is very much here. Um, in my house for Christmas. Because uh, because your mum uh, said she didn't expect to see... I think she's 83 now, and she, I think it was June was her birthday. She said she didn't expect to see that, uh, but now she's going to make Christmas. Uh, yeah, she'll probably live forever, you know, so this discussion will become redundant. But to be serious, how, how is she? So it's interesting. We got the diagnosis in January, and when we were speaking to the oncologist, she said, well, I would love to see spring. Um, she and I are very keen on our gardens and the labour of love that is planting bulbs in November should be seen. So she'd be annoyed if she didn't get to see the tulips. But um, do tulips come out in spring? Maybe it's daffodils. I'm not a knowledgeable gardener. I'm keen. Um, so the Don Connor just said he would be surprised if she didn't make spring. And when we have tried to ask how long she's going to live, he fudges around and said, you'll die sometime between now and the next 10 years which is when, her gra when my granny, her mother died when she was 93. Um, also not a very nice death. But so how is she is a big, big, big question. She is fine up to the next scan. That's how we live. We live from scan to scan. At the time of the scan that she previously had, she was okay. She's on this miracle drug. When it stops working, we'll have to reassess and things happen quite quickly, which is why she has been brilliant and organised and thoughtful and gone ahead to make a safety net for herself. Please give her all, all, <laughs> yeah. all of our best wishes, won't you? Can we I wish you say, both a very happy Yeah, Christmas. you're brilliant, organised and thoughtful too. And I can't think of a better person to deputise for your mother after her 37 years at Childline. It's been, been a real honour speaking to you. Thank, Thank you, you, Rebecca. Thank you so much. <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Uh, we're still joined in the studio by uh, Rebecca Ryan, campaign director of Defund the BBC. Well, sometimes uh, in broadcasting, you get those moments. That was one of them. Absolutely. And what a testament to her mum she is. I mean, what, what an amazing woman, you mm. know, and, and that's, you know, just reflective of, of the power of Esther mm. Ranson, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I wish them all the best. My, my mum passed away from cancer when I was 25. She was 52. So I know that that's yeah. like a really, really hard mm. time. Um, and yeah, it chokes it chokes people up having to think about that. But it's good. You can see why Esther wants to try and have some control over how it's, she passes. Yeah, it's a very difficult debate, but it's yeah. definitely a debate I think worth having. It's very easy to turn around and go, right, we should just introduce assisted dying. But yeah. when you look at how things are happening yep. in Canada, there are major pitfalls that mm. must be avoided. There's all sorts of allegations that, you know, young women with anorexia mm. are being encouraged to go down that path. I mean, and you think, well, come on, yeah. is that really the sort of but person you should be dealing with? you know what I mean, think about with? that, though? I, I just think it's people mm. looking for excuses to object to this you know, uh, on the, a wider plane, it just doesn't make any sense to tell grown adults you can't make a decision about ending your own life. It's very difficult, you know. I think you've got to assess someone's uh, mental health yeah. and, and their capability to make a rational decision. But also, when somebody who is, has a chronic medical condition, this happened in my family, mm -hmm. you see them suffering towards mm -hmm. the end. They, they, they lose their uh, physical capacity, but not their mental capacity. The burden it puts on them 
again, the misery. There are some yeah. conditions that cannot be alleviated with drugs, particularly. So, yeah. And the pressure exactly. also puts on their loved ones who become full-time carers and have to watch yeah. this sort of degeneration. But um, do you think, what, what is the approach we should be taking? Should there be a free vote in Parliament? Mm. Should it be a referendum among people? What should be the mechanism by which we have this debate as a country? Yeah, I mean, I think they should. I, I mean, I absolutely would back Esther's call for there to be a free vote in Parliament. But I think, as you said, it's a really complicated issue. You know, I can see sort of two sides of this. You know, when my, my mum was in hospital in the final day, she had to sign a sort of do not resuscitate, you know, and her handwriting was so way, you know, it, 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 and then also, they, you know, yeah. the palliative care is basically most people die of cancer. They're dying of, of morphine poisoning. Mm. So we are essentially doing it, but in a sort of really sort of strange way. Well, you, you know me, but the mm. way I uh, uh, the way I see it, or mm. my point is, uh, politicians stick out of my yep. life, and now you can stick out of my death yep. as well. And uh, in case you're uh, confused about uh, the body politic and our justice system's approach to end-of-life discussions. Don't forget, until very recently, it was against the law to commit suicide. Mm. So what are you going to do about it? Oh, arrest that man. Oh, he's killed himself, you know. <laughs> it's just absurd. <laughs> it's absurd. We were, just um, <clears throat> early stop on, it. Early on, Kevin said to me, oh, the way I'm feeling, I might not make it to the end of the show. <laughs> so uh, if you I'm not very well today. Me, <laughs> if you fancy sitting next to me over the next two days, uh, do message him. Yeah. <laughs> we'll be holding auditions that <laughs> come tomorrow. Right, coming up after the break, disgraced Baroness Michelle Moan lashes out at Rishi Sunak, accusing him of having known about her links to PPE companies during the pandemic. I'm Alex Phillip. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Bravman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can't, can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that.
Welcome to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, Michelle Moan has hit back at the Prime Minister after he said he took the PPE scandal extremely seriously. Yeah, the Baroness, who has had admitted lying to the press over PPE deals made in the pandemic, said ministers knew all along about her links to the company. She tweeted, what is Rishi Sunak on about? I was honest with the Cabinet Office, the government and the NHS in my dealings with them. They all knew about my involvement from the very beginning. Uh, Rebecca Ryan, campaign director at Defund the BBC, is still with us. I'll tell you what really annoys me. Let's, let's by the way, fill in the gaps there. This is her husband's company. Uh, what's it called? Uh, PPE Medro, Medpro. Uh, uh, she used her position to use this very suspicious VIP lane system <laughs> during the COVID, whereby anyone who had good contacts could get in touch with the government and say, I can get you PPE, because there was a yep. shortage. So she used her position to say, you know, I know this firm, happens to belong to my husband. They made £200 million from the government, £60 uh, million pound profit. Uh, she says she's done nothing wrong. Uh, look, but uh, she did lie. She lied about having any connection to this at all. What annoys me, Rebecca, is this. Uh, she, she seems to think uh, lying is kind of wrong, but it's OK to lie to the press. Uh, and here's her problem now. Once you lie once... Why should anyone ever believe you again? That's Yeah, exactly. And the thing is, I think I do... I agree with you on that. She shouldn't have told that lie. You know, she sh should have realised this was going to keep keep going yeah. and keep going and keep going. But at yeah. the same time, I think she is being ma made a scapegoat. Mm. This is all the result of a government that was clambering to oh. lock us down. And, you know, it was just in absolute spasm, wasn't it, in how it's going to deliver all of these things, yeah. you know. And that's yeah. not how governments should run. They shouldn't be, you know... Uh, yeah. Right. assigning those things. There is an interesting nuance here, isn't there? Because, of course, what we do know is the government had set up this mm. VIP channel and said to their peers, their donors, their MPs, oh, if you can get your mitts on PP, yeah. we need it because we've stuffed up our supplies. Yeah. We were supposed to be prepared for a pandemic and guess what, we're not. So they did actually give a call out. She responded to it. But the shady bit is, of course, when she said, I know a company who can do this. Five days later, she says to her husband, hmm, this has just got a £200 million pound contract. Perhaps we should invest in it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, but I think there was probably so much of that going on at the time, wasn't there? there? Was. This is the thing. These business the people are like, well, we're not going to be able to run our usual business, so let's get churning out some PPE. Yeah. And where did that all go? I mean, that's what loads of companies, yeah. you know, owned by VIPs with access to the VIP lanes, completely changed their modus operandi yeah. and start, stopped producing whatever they, you know, I don't know, spanners or whatever. Uh, nuts and bolts and started producing PPE yep. because not only uh, was there good government money in it for them, the government uh, ad admitted it was paying well over the odds for this stuff, this PPE, mm -hmm. because it was an emergency. So you had this right uh, or a method of just making a fortune. That's yep. what uh, her husband... husband's called Doug Barrowman, by the way. And by the way, uh, they both... Uh, 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 belong to the Prince Andrew School of BBC interviews because their interview on Sunday with Laura Koonsberg on the Beeb mm. was a car crash. Yeah. And she keeps saying, uh, I, lie, I, di I lie to the press to protect my family. That doesn't protect your family, does it? Yeah. That doesn't stack up. And then she, uh, before that, she, uh, her, that company, in, a, in other words, Baroness Bra, funded a kind of hagiography documentary uh, to say, oh, well, they, these, you know, Baroness Bra and Doug Barrowman are great people. Ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the thing, isn't it? She, she, uh, you'd think that someone of her stature and with her experience would have had better advice than that. A lot of people say, well, told... why was she in the House of Lords in the first place? David so, Cameron! Yeah! yeah. <laughs> she could have just, like, got everyone to strap their bra over their face, <laughs> you know, there. Moving on to uh, the story we did before the break, uh, we spoke to the daughter of Dame Esther Ranson, the broadcaster, who has revealed she would consider ending her life through assisted dying as she battles stage four lung cancer. Yeah, you've been getting in touch on this topic. Catherine from Cornwall is actually on the line. Thank you for joining us, Catherine. What's your view on this? Do you think it's about time we had a national conversation about this? Or is this an area that you think that we should just let be and not go wading into it? No, I definitely approve of, of uh, euthanasia. I need to tell you briefly about my, the situation that my poor husband has found himself in. 
He was diagnosed at 48 with Parkinson's and he soldiered on as long as he could. The thing, he had, he, he lost his job, he couldn't keep that. A couple of years ago, he tried to kill himself oh. by taking 32 paracetamol. He thought that he would go to sleep and not wake up. But unfortunately, he didn't know that it would take three months to kill him. So when I found out I had to phone the ambulance, so I did. So his life was saved. So he came home, and every day he would ask me to kill him. Every day. Every so, single day. Catherine, you say he was diagnosed when he was 48. Uh, how, it, how old was he when you finally lost him? I haven't lost him. You haven't. That, He's that still is, with you. That is, the, that is the problem. How old is he now? He's 62. Oh, and so early, so, so he lost his job. He lost his driving licence. He's now lost his home because this year I, it became impossible for me to be able to look after him at home. So since April, he's been in a care home. Oh. And um, so he's lost his job. He's lost his driving licence. He's lost his home. He's lost control of his body. He has, he, he has no dignity left. He strives very, very hard not to let people help him. He dresses himself. When I saw him on Sunday, he had a T-shirt on, a pyjama top on top of that, and then another T-shirt on top of that, trousers with no belt in it, somebody else's slippers, and a hole in his sock. And that's what he managed to do for himself. C Catherine, uh, what's your husband's name? He's called... I would prefer not to say, okay. if you don't mind. Uh, and, you know, I, I'm deducing... Uh, I'm very, very sorry for your uh, situation, by the way. It's tragic. Uh, and to me, sums up why uh, adults should be able to make the decision to end their own life, both you and your husband. But I'm deducing from what you're saying that if you had the chance, uh, you would have helped him to die at some point. Would you have done that? Oh, absolutely. I would have supported him all the way. You see, the one thing he needs... The one thing he wants is to die. And it's the one thing he can't have. Have you got kids, Catherine? No. Aww. Just a dog. <sighs> Catherine, I'm so... Uh, I, I can hear the emotion in your voice and, and the huge toll this is having on you. And it's been incredibly, incredibly brave for you to Thank you, call Catherine. us up and talk to us. Thank you so much. Thank for you so your much. Uh, our best to your husband. Yeah. Uh, let's go to uh, Vivian in Devon now. Uh, hello, Vivian. Hello. I just think people with a degenerative illness should have the right as well. Do you, do you have any personal uh, encounters or personal anecdotes or situations where you've seen someone uh, who would have potentially chosen to end chronic suffering? Yes, me. <laughs> I've got MS. <laughs> Oh, oh, Vivian, yeah. my uncle died of MS and he also contemplated Dignitas. Did he? Uh, yeah, I, he really I, I did, too, yeah. I couldn't get there now. I'm too immobile oh. to get there. But, but what I'm sure, Vivian, what you would like, I mean, would you, if you had the chance, would you uh, go the Dignitas route? Because what I'm saying to you is, if you do, rather than have to go all the way to Switzerland, wouldn't it be a better system if we had a sensible country, a sensible legal system that allowed people like you to make uh, a, an adult decision about ending your own life? Would you like that to be the situation here in Britain? Yes, I do. I get fed up with healthy, pain-free people going on about the sanctity of life. Ah, yes. Just spend a week in my shoes. Oh, that's no, I don't wear shoes anymore because I can't walk. Um, that's, that's such a good point. All the people who go, oh, yeah, we can't allow people to take their own lives. There's, not, there's often very little wrong with them. They're healthy. Uh, and that's another uh, point in my view. Uh, you know, what right have I, a uh, reasonably healthy sort of middle-aged man-ish, uh, you know, to, to, what right have I got to start imposing, uh, you know, 
instructions on people like you. I, I just think it's incredible. What do you think about the fact we have a parliament? 2015, I think, was the last vote on this. Funnily enough, the vote against it was led by a certain David Cameron. Uh, what do you think of the fact you've got 650 MPs sitting there in West Westminster and they have decided that you cannot make a decision about your own life? What do you think about that? I think it's dreadful. They have got no idea... They can't have, well, otherwise they wouldn't be doing the jobs they're doing if they'd got any idea of what it was like. No, and in this, these days, oh, it's your human right to do this, that and the other. But it's not my human right to say when I've had enough. Vivian, if you're, if you're willing and able to, can you share with us what it's like for you every day? I mean, I'm familiar with uh, MS and the disease and how... Utterly awful, indescribably awful it can be, having lost my uncle to it. But are you able to sort of talk other people through what it is like for you every day? I can hardly move. I used to be a very active person. I had a horse for 14 years. Then I had two rescued ponies and four sheep. Um, but I can't stand up on my own now. I rely on my husband, who has been amazing for just about everything, cleaning my teeth. But the main thing is the pain, nerve pain. I, I live with it. It can be excruciating. And that, that you, there's medication for it, or gabapentins and things. I can't take them because of the side effects are too bad. So there's nothing I can take for the pain. Well, listen, uh, Vivian, thank you so much for calling. I'm going to ask you uh, a, a last uh, question. I mean, do you think that the fact that in this country uh, the law bans you uh, from deciding to end your life is stripping you of your dignity? Yes. It is. Well, I, I, just, I just can't believe that I shouldn't have the choice to say, I can't suffer like this anymore. Absolutely. But no, they say, no, it's fine, you can carry on suffering. Yeah. That's what it's about. It's about forcing someone to chronically suffer. Vivian, thank you Vivian, so much Vivian, our very best wishes. Uh, um, so sorry. I'll be thinking about you a lot. I really will, Vivian. Thank you so much for calling in. And uh, Thanks, Vivian. Yeah. I don't know what to say, you know. I, I mean, come on, this is ridiculous. I saw, Vivian I, should yeah. have the right to make this decision. Yeah. Uh, it's absolutely ridiculous. Anyway, yeah, lots of we're, we're going to be uh, covering this story throughout the break, uh, throughout the show. Calls coming in thick and fast. Uh, coming up after the break, the long awaited and delayed transgender guidance for schools has finally been published, but some schools are threatening to ignore it. Uh, I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. I'm Alex Phillips, <laughs> and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The 
weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years. Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares oh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Just Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, before the break, we spoke to the daughter of Dame Esther Ranson, the broadcaster who has revealed she would consider ending her life through assisted dying as she battles stage four lung cancer. Uh, your texts and tweets have been coming in on this. Uh, Wayne says, people in this country should be able to die in dignity and painless for the families that it affects and the suffering it causes, the law needs to change. And Claire says, yes, we should have the choice to die with dignity. We don't let our dogs suffer. Also, when the NHS stop treatment in hospital, they go on the I plan, which withdraws all medications, foods and fluids. And the death is horrible to watch and can take days, sometimes weeks. And Julie from Scarborough is now on the line. Uh, Julie, what's your feeling on this incredibly sensitive topic? Well, I'm obviously greatly in favour of a change in the law for assisted dying because um, my husband, Nigel, went to Dignitas in April um, 2017. Blimey. T tell us more about Nigel, what he was going through, what provoked the decision and how difficult that was to organise? Um, well, Nigel had suffered with motor neuron disease for 10 years. And um, obviously, he, he, he was very, very brave throughout those 10 years. He um, became increasingly disabled, um, but he never lost his uh, sense of humour and his spirit. But after 10 years, he felt that he was, um, the disease was beginning to impact on his spirit and his sense of self, and he really couldn't bear losing that sense of self. Uh, uh, Julie, uh, uh, absurdly, uh, you probably have to be careful about answering this, uh, but did you accompany Nigel uh, to Switzerland? I did. I went with him, as did our three children. And um, we, we were very concerned. Nigel, more than any of us, were very concerned about the prospect of um, an investigation when we got home. Um, it was something that caused Nigel undue stress. And um, he was truly, truly disturbed about that. It added to what was already a very incredibly emotional trip um so so yeah the, the law should change we shouldn't have had that anxiety on top of everything uh, and, and, and were you uh Julie, were you investigated no um no what happened on our return the first thing i did was phone uh my solicitor who advised me to let the uh, nigel's doctor know who in turn would inform the coroner and the decision of what would happen next would be in the coroner's hands. And um, 
anyway, we got the phone call to say that nothing would happen. But um, there was a great deal of media publicity. Uh, Nigel's story hit the headlines shortly afterwards. And you would have thought that if there was going to be an investigation, that would have been then. Uh, that would have prompted such a thing. Julie, can you give us some sense of what it was like to be able to have a proper goodbye? What were the final moments like? Um, well, it, it was marvellous that we could have um, that final goodbye. But, but the final moments were, of course, incredibly emotional. But um, it was equally, if not more so, distressing that uh, we had to leave him there. Um, that, that was the hardest thing, to actually leave, leave him. See, I, th I think uh, inherent in what you're saying, Julie, is another one of these kind of anomalies, an absurdity. The, 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 the authorities here, yeah, of course they made the right decision about you. Of course you and your children shouldn't be investigated. Uh, but more to the point, of course you shouldn't have to worry about it, and nor should Nigel. Uh, that's the absurdity of it, that, you, that OK, uh, the authorities made the right decision and didn't investigate, but you had to worry about it. And why do we have a system where the authorities have to kind of sort of, uh, sort of navigate the law, circumnavigate and say, oh, come on, common sense. We need to have a law. We, we need the law to allow you to do that as a family, don't we? Oh, absolutely. And um, I'm a com complete supporter of um, the Dignity in Dying organization who are obviously fighting non-stop to change the law um, it could not be um, it could not be more important to, to save people going through this additional distress and of course all the rest of Nigel's family were a large family a close family he's got um, brother two sisters and same with my uh, two brothers and sister and you know everybody it was agonizing for everybody to have to say goodbye to us here yeah. in Scarborough knowing they would never see him again. I'm so glad you got that opportunity. Julie, you've been very brave thank following you, the Julie. show. And thank you ever so much. That was Julie. Whew. Well, coming up after the break, we're going to have more reaction to that emotional interview with Dame Esther Ranson's daughter on her calls to legalise assisted dying. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds so far result nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walked into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideology? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, Ofcom. 
Mm. Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a have, terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, can you? Use? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place uh, where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone, this is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome back to Crosstalk. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. And we are with you live from 1 until 3 every weekday. Coming up in this hour, Rishi's school rules. Teachers will be banned from letting kids change their gender if their parents say no under new trans guidance that promises to put parents first. But ministers warn it must be made into law as schools threaten to flout it. And Dame Esther Ranson's dying wish. The broadcaster says she will go to Dignitas if her treatment for stage 4 lung cancer is unsuccessful. And EU border farce. Uh, strict new entry requirements for Brits travelling to Europe will come into force next year, prompting fears of huge queues and the end of the last-minute getaway. All that coming up, but first, let's get the news headlines with Nadira Tudor. Good afternoon. There are concerns Iceland's capital Reykjavik could be hit by gas pollution after a volcanic eruption overnight. 4,000 residents were evacuated from their homes, describing the crazy and scary scenes as lava began spilling out near the Blue Lagoon. Homes and businesses in its path have been destroyed. It's not expected to bring the same level of disruption as the one in 2010, which halted European air travel. But experts say this eruption has a surprising pattern and should last for some time. It is impossible right now um, to establish uh, how long it is going to be uh, the eruption, uh, but comparing with the east, previous history of uh, Icelandic eruption, realistically it is going to last uh, no more than a few months. At least 126 people have died in China and hundreds injured in one of the country's deadliest earthquakes in years. The 6.2 magnitude quake struck the mountainous northwest region early this morning and emergency crews are facing sub-zero temperatures as they scour the wreckage. The government has published its long-awaited non-statutory transgender guidance for schools and colleges in England. It says schools do not have to and should not accept all requests for social transition and don't have to address pupils in chosen pronouns. It also says single-sex spaces must be protected. Ten Tory MPs have written to the Foreign Secretary demanding the government backs an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Lord David Cameron is visiting Paris and Rome in a diplomatic push to lobby for unity in the European approach to the Israel-Hamas war. Meanwhile, it's been reported another 20 people have been killed in southern Gaza in airstrikes overnight. Four out of five dentists in England are no longer taking on new NHS patients. A report by the Nuffield Trust found NHS dentistry is at its most perilous point in its 75-year history. They're blaming access issues, a lack of funding and the pandemic. The think tank claims budgets for the service have dropped by more than half a billion pounds since 2014. And Dame Esther Ranson says she's considering the option of assisted dying if her lung cancer treatment does not improve her condition. The 83-year-old Childline founder and broadcaster has revealed she's joined the Swiss clinic Dignitas and is calling for a vote on the legality of assisted dying. Her daughter Rebecca told Talk TV they support her choice. Um, if you've met my mum, she doesn't come to decisions lightly and she doesn't change her mind. So by the time we heard about it, it was 
intractable law in our house. But she has always said that she wants to have a dignified life and a dignified death. And the process of dying replaces and supersedes your family's memories if it's a terrible death. That's the latest now for a look at today's weather with Nazanin Gaffer. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello, it was a wet start across many parts of England and Wales this morning. You can see it on the earlier satellite and radar picture. Uh, lots of rain, particularly heavy across parts of the west. But a lot of that rain is now clearing away down southeastwards, allowing for much drier and sunnier conditions for England and Wales this afternoon. On the other hand, Scotland and Northern Ireland will continue with sunny spells, but there will also be blustery showers across these areas. A few of them may also reach parts of the northwest of England. And it's going to be feeling cooler as the day progresses as that rain clears top temperatures up into the high single figure, so 8 or 9 degrees Celsius. Now, overnight, we'll continue with the rash of showers from the northwest. Winds will become uh, stronger through the night as well across northern areas. Further south, though, I think we will see mostly dry conditions with long, clear spells and lighter winds. It will be a cool night for everywhere, especially across rural spots of Scotland. Then for tomorrow, yes, lots of sunshine to begin the day, but already blustery showers across the northwest. Then another area of rain pushing its way southwards through the day across much of Scotland, Northern Ireland, northern parts of England and Wales. So rather cloudy and damp fair across the these areas drier in the south, but cloudy as well. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. We have lots coming up over the next hour, including that emotional interview with Dame Esther Ranson's daughter on her calls to legalise assisted dying. Uh, listen to that, Alex, uh, because of your uncle, you got quite emotional. Those, those were, I mean, it was incredible talking to uh, Dame Esther's daughter, it's, Rebecca. Yeah. Amazing interview. Uh, and the, the, the calls we got as a result of that were very emotional. And you got very, you were crying, weren't you? Well, a little bit. I mean, these things, I find uncle. it very emotional because, you know, at the end of the day, these are people's lives. And you can talk about a subject clinically, you can talk about a subject politically, philosophically. But when you actually really imagine and know suffering that people are going through, whether it's uh, someone with a chronic condition, whether it's the relatives of that person, uh, and you emote with the subject, it's, you know, there aren't easy answers in how to legislate it, how to regulate it. There aren't. And it's something that we can't just rush into, mm. but it's something we definitely need to have a conversation about. Do you know what I about. think about? Do you know what those calls also make, make me? Uh, don't get me wrong, but they make me very angry. Yeah. They make me very angry for those poor people, you know, who should be allowed the dignity of making their own decisions. These are grown, compass people. And you have 650 MPs in uh, Westminster, many of whom, in my view, are not compass mentors, uh, telling them they can't do it, that they don't have control of their own bodies. You know, get out of our lives. You Absolutely. Know? And these are people who are living in pain, you know, 24-7. Yeah. You know, they can't sleep. They can't, you know, they're, they're in constant agony. Mm. And then, like you say, you've got these people who are disconnected from any kind of reality. Mm. They're in, in Westminster just thinking about sort of how it's going to play out in the, in the uh, next general election. Yeah. <laughs> You know, with their whatever Christian yeah. voter base or whatever, you know, whatever their motives so are, right. they're, you know, they're just not actually engaging with the reality of this situation. The the, probably the truth is in Westminster yeah. that people are computing. It's not enough votes in this. Yeah. I think Outrageous. Two, two things that really stood out for me. First of all, we had Vivian who mm. said, how dare people mm. with easy yeah, lives I, and so able powerful. bodies tell me yeah. when I have the right mm. to stop suffering. Yeah. But, and, and then Julie, who talked about her late husband, Nigel, mm. and said what got him was when he felt like it was his spirit that was cracking. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, he'd been suffering this horrible motor neuron disease for such a long time and when he found his sort of psychologically psychological resilience crumbling that's when he said i can't do and this. in his dying moments yeah. so that's what she, what julie was so um, i think uh, frustrated about let's put it uh, uh, diplomatically shall we uh, she said what why you know that obviously her and her children were worried about uh, yeah. being prosecuted when they got back but of course the poor poor uh, uh, nigel he, he, his 
dying moments, he's worried about his wife and his mm. kids. That's Absolutely. ridiculous. It's awful to have that additional burden, isn't it? And But also, as she said, one of the worst things about it was that they had to leave his body, leave behind. body behind. And that, as anyone who's lost anyone close to them knows, yeah. that is such a key part of the mourning process. Yeah. So to have to leave him there and travel back to yeah. the UK wondering if they're going to be prosecuted was just a very vivid, uh, you know, picture that she painted there. Uh, and, and uh, you know, since this is uh, Talk TV, the home of common sense, it's common sense that yeah. people should be allowed to make these decisions. And I cannot believe for the life of me that the three of us mm -hmm. are not expressing what the majority yeah. of people, the vast majority yeah. of people in this country think. So uh, Parliament, Westminster, should get with the programme. Yeah. I mean, one thing I think is quite remarkable is that who better, in a way, than to spark a national debate over something which is all about caring for people than Dame Esther Ranson, who spent 30 seven years at Childline, just stepping down and handing the reins in many respects over to her daughter, a service that has helped so many young people go through uh, pain and suffering and help manage their crises. And shall we remind ourselves of uh, what her daughter, Rebecca Wilcox, had to say? But she has always said that she wants to have a dignified life and a dignified death. And the process of dying replaces and supersedes your family's memories if it's a terrible death. And I know that when my father died, all we thought about for years were those last seconds, those last moments when it was tubes, there was blood, there was beeping, there were nurses, there were doctors, there was a lot of crying. And that's all, all I could remember of my father for so long. Well, we have been asking you today, should we have the right to choose to end our own lives? You can give us a call, 0344 499 1000. You can text us, 87 treble 2 or of course, tweet us on X, and the handle for that is at TalkTV. Your texts and tweets have been coming in on this very emotional subject this lunchtime. Tim says, I worked for 30 years with all end of life patients and the process can be incredibly complicated with it differing between patients. Given the choice, I would say every single patient should opt for assisted dying. Death isn't easy. And Bill writes, uh, there already is assisted death in this country and there always has been. My father was destroyed by cancer at the age of 38 and in the last days of his life, the medical team increased his morphine hour by hour to ease his passing. We sat by his side whilst they did this. Mm -hmm. And uh, you've been calling too. Uh, Carl from Newport is on the line. Hello, Carl, what would you like to say? Hi there. Um, well, it's really about my wife's grandmother. Um, she passed away five years ago and she had dementia and uh, she had a little bit of a fall in the house. Uh, she ended up with a compound fracture, and uh, the NHS decided to leave her for two weeks with a compound fracture yeah. until she died of septicemia. That is yeah. absolutely um, shocking. And in, yeah, some, it, and in it, some pain, I should imagine. Yeah, she was in quite a lot of pain. She didn't really know where she was. She kept calling me her husband who died back in 1994, so I couldn't really go anymore with my wife for support because it was upsetting her just seeing me. So, um, yeah, it, it was just horrendous, absolutely horrendous. And what's your view, yeah, Carl? Uh, what's your view, Carl? Uh, should we, uh, this is what we're asking everyone today, should we uh, be able to choose, uh, to make the decision to choose to end our own lives? Should we be allowed to do that by law? I think if I can choose to put my dog down, if it's an XL bully or if it's got something wrong with it, I think I can choose to put myself down. It's absolutely right. Couldn't agree with you more. Yeah, your partner's mother, was she left in the hospital for two weeks with this compound fracture? Yeah, yeah. My, my wife's grandmother, Doreen, she was left um, in the hospital for the two weeks for the compound fracture. They gave her morphine to try and ease it, but they basically just said because of her age, because she was 94, there was nothing they could do. They weren't going to operate. They said it was a 95% chance she'd die if she went under anaesthetic and she wouldn't wake back up. But in the end, my wife and I, I believe we both agreed that would probably be better. And did you, did you feel like she had uh, lots of support and were her last two weeks comfortable or was it just incredibly no. difficult? No, I went a few times and she was wet in the bed and whatnot. So. See, this is and it, isn't it? I mean, people... People go without, you know, they're stripped of their dignity in their final uh, days, months, hours, 
And uh, that's just wrong, I think, Carl, and uh, I'm glad to hear you agree, and you've got reason to agree. Thank you very much for the call and uh, our very best wishes. Yeah. Uh, let's go to a guest now. Uh, Jackie Davis is a consultant radiologist and chair of healthcare professionals for assisted dying. Well, uh, Jackie, I'm a, a trained observer, and I suspect that you're agreeing with us today. Uh, we, uh, the three of us here in the studio, uh, Dame Mester Ranson's daughter, Rebecca, every caller we've had uh, have said it is time to allow people to make this decision, uh, to die with dignity, uh, to save their loved ones from watching them go without dignity. Why, why, why? is our, our body politic and our legal system behind the pace on this one? Um, yes, you're absolutely right, of course. I'm very, I've campaigned for this for years, as have many people. And it's not surprising that your viewers and you indeed are in favour of this. Over 80% of the British public want legislation for assisted dying. And it has become the big question. Why are the politicians not listening? And you, know, you just have to look around the world um, 250 million people now have access to assisted dying. It's coming closer. Scotland, Isle of Man, Jersey are all looking to pass laws. Um, and yet we see our politicians sitting with their fingers in their ears, not listening, and not listening to the call for compassion for dying people. So it is a big, a big question. And I really hope for one, you know, Dame Esther Rance has been so brave to do this, that this will break the logjam that we've got between what the public would like and the fact that politicians aren't prepared to step up and do that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I can probably offer you the reason why they aren't prepared. Good, and I would I imagine. <laughs> no, I would imagine it is because it will come with a whole load of extra legislation, and it will be a whole, you know, huge monstrous amount of work because one would have to consider where the thresholds would be placed, how you assess if someone is capable mentally of making the decision, whether there should be certain limits as to what level of suffering someone should be experiencing before they make that decision, what age they should be. Uh, do you have an idea of, I mean, it, like, it is a huge topic when you start looking into that level of detail, but do you have any idea what a framework should look like for this? Or should it be as simple as if you are over the age of 18 and you choose you want to do this and you can demonstrate that you are uh, in completely rational minds that you should be able to? Uh, that's a really important point. You know, do we want to get bogged down in a whole load of details like that? It, we don't have to reinvent the wheel over this. Um, this law has been present in some places uh, for, for a long time now. You know, Oregon, for instance, have had an assisted dying law for over 25 years. It works well. Less than 1% of the, of, the, of the population actually use it. But everybody knows that it's available if they or their loved ones need it. And it's never changed. Um, and that is, by and large, the model that has been taken by the other jurisdictions that ha have taken up assisted dying. So we, we just have to go and see how other people are doing it. We can, do, we can take what they've done well and use that. In some places, we might not like what they've done, and we can change that. But we don't have to start from scratch. And it, it's a really important point that other people are doing it. There's never, no one's ever put, put the law into reverse. Everybody's been very happy with having it. And quite honestly, you know, all the objections and concerns just melt away when a law comes into place. People see it's compassionate, it's safe, it's so much better than what we've got at the moment, and we would just get on with it. And I hope that's going to happen very soon now. And this uh, suggestion from people who object to uh, assisted dying, you know, that uh, perhaps people will be forced into it by relatives who want to get rid of them. Uh, perhaps uh, people will make, you know, their mental faculties are too, uh, you know, inept to make these decisions and so on and so forth. You know, I mean, you all know about this, but if we allowed assisted dying, I'll tell you right now, you know... <laughs> or, uh, all but a vanishingly small number of cases will be completely legitimate reasons for that people want to end their lives. I just don't think uh, that there's any reason to block this anymore because there will not be a massive surge of people, oh, we can get rid of Auntie Doris now. It's just not, not uh, feasible. It's not uh, likely to happen, is it? You're absolutely right. And the important thing about having decades and decades of experience in other parts of the world, which has been very closely monitored, of course, um, is that there's no evidence of um, people being coerced into this. 
And the criteria for the law in Oregon, which most people have followed, is very clear. You've got to be um, terminally ill uh, with less than six months to live. You've got to be of sound mind. So if you're demented, you can't ask for this. Um, and you've got to be a fixed purpose. In other words, you can't ask for it and have it five minutes later. Um, you know, there has to be a time interval between two requests, let's say. Um, there is no evidence of coercion. Um, but uh, the problem is that the, the most of the opposition to assisted dying comes from faith groups. Interestingly, they don't represent their members. Um, people with disabilities, people of faith are like the general public in favor of a legislation for assisted dying, but their leaders aren't. And that's where the opposition comes from. The opposition in this country is very small, but it's very vocal. Um, and they can't say for religious reasons they're on board with this because we're a secular society now. But uh, what they push up as a straw man in front of that belief is, oh, we're worried about vulnerable people. And churches ask their congregations to write sackloads of letters when legislation is being discussed in order to say we're worried about vulnerable people and they have no idea whether vulnerable people are in danger or not. And the, and the fact is there isn't. But that's what we're up against in getting a law is MPs getting sack loads of, of letters from people encouraged by their faith groups to write these letters when in fact there's no, there's no evidence uh, uh, um, that these things are happening and we really have to overcome that. Thanks, yeah. Jackie. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Really uh, yeah, interesting point. Well, here's a, a point though. Uh, Jackie just revealed, I didn't realise it was uh, uh, this large a majority, that 80% of the mm. British public want this to happen. Yeah. So uh, aside from the fact it'll take a lot of bureaucratic work to get this law into action, you'd think, given those numbers, that our vote-hungry politicians uh, might go, right, 80%, there's votes in this. Uh, what, what, so why still the resistance? I mean, I would think that the politicians would say that most people just don't even want to really think about death. It's a subject we don't yeah. like to talk You're about, really. So they get easily, the election, yeah, yeah. It's not going to be, a, you know, get people excited on the doorstep. So it's a yeah. topic that they can easily sweep yeah. under the carpet and yes. we'll deal with that another yeah. time. It's funny, isn't it, that the church will die on a hill for LGBTQ and trans rights, that we haven't <laughs> had a debate about abortion in this country for decades now, and yet this one topic where it has so much public support, um, the church wants to put its fingers in its ears. Mm. Yeah, so that these, um, I mean, it strikes me, and this is just my speculation, but these MPs or politicians are, are worried about the vocal mm. power of faith groups, yeah. churches, etc. I, I can't see that the church is particularly that vocal in this country yeah, but, anymore, I mean, to be honest. To, as Jackie that? just says, every time this is proposed, mm -hmm. the churches get their congregations to pile in the letters. That sort of thing tends to perturb politicians. But, you know, sure it's it's, I still think, it, I still think it's a mystery, given that 80% of people want this to happen, mm. that politicians are uh, rejecting it. But uh, mm. there you are. Well, your texts and tweets have been coming in on this subject. Sheena says, I have multiple sclerosis. I'm so sorry, Sheena. And I have contemplated ending my life. Drugs are currently halting the progression of the disease, but should it get worse, I would absolutely go ahead and end my life and demand that the law is changed in the UK to allow this. Uh, Amanda says, dying with dignity is a human right. Shame on those who seek to prevent this. I have nothing but immense admiration and respect for those fighting for the law to be changed in this country. And Stephen writes, I was a Samaritan volunteer for 10 years and I have always believed that as long as you are of sound mind, you should legally be allowed to end your own life if that is your wish. Sadly, religious lefty zealots think differently. I'm not sure if they're lefties, <laughs> but, uh, you know, a sort of, uh, <laughs> you know. <laughs> and your people explain this, don't they? It's, oh, well, you know, why should the state be able to decide, you know, whether you can die or not? But that is what they're doing in any yeah. case, isn't it? Now, coming up after the break, the long-awaited and delayed transgender guidance for schools has finally been published, but some schools are threatening to ignore it. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones.
I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideologies? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So. Yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that won't. is very telling. Talk TV. It's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry. We can agree on that. Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the long awaited and delayed transgender guidance for schools has finally been published, and teachers will not have to address pupils in their chosen pronouns with more power given to parents. But ministers are warning that the new guidance must be made into law after some schools vowed to flout the rules and ignore pleas to tell parents when children want to switch their gender. Well, joining us now is Serge Safai, the executive head teacher of the St Thomas the Apostle College in London, and Maya Forstater, the executive director of Sex Matters Advocacy Group. Serge, I'm going to start with you. As a head teacher, um, have you had to face issues in your school of a child saying, I want to change my pronouns and I don't want the parents to know, and being in that tug of war of, you know, what the school's duty is? And, and do you think what the government has put in place in the framework of guidelines is enough? Uh, well, first answer is not really. Second, about time and very welcome. Uh, schools have been put in a really difficult position for too long. And uh, I'm glad that finally someone stepped in and seen sense because uh, I'm, you know, it's like everyone's forgotten about puberty in adolescence. These are decisions that need to be taken first and foremost when a child is old enough. But the idea that you wouldn't tell parents I've been in this job 40 plus years and I've often told teachers when you know more about a child than the parents do, with the exception of um, safeguarding issues, think twice. Tell the parents, get them involved, they've got to be involved and the fact that some teachers are saying they won't, well get Ofsted in and get them out of schools because that's completely wrong. Yeah, the problem here, Serge, is, you know, I agree that this is, uh, this, uh, 
smacks of common sense, but I agree with the people who say either you, you have laws about this uh, or it's not going to work. Guidance is one thing. Guidance means you can ignore guidance. Now, I think uh, I've great respect for teachers, of course, but if a child comes to a teacher at school and says, look, I think I'm in the wrong body, I want to be a girl, I want to be a boy, I mean, that's a profound uh, thing. And I think that the school should then tell the parents. Uh, under guidance, uh, they don't have to, and therefore some won't and some teachers won't. Uh, so uh, whilst I applaud the impulse of this guidance, surely it needs to be... Uh, law, it needs to be stronger than this, so you know exactly where you are. Yeah, well, I couldn't agree more. Let's make it law, but at least this is a first step. It's been ignored now for years, and it is all sorts of really difficult decisions have been made without any guidance at all. And uh, I go back to my main point. Parents need to be involved about everything to do with their children, with the exception of safeguarding issues. It's a nonsense that's even considered by any teacher. Uh, Maya, this is one of those topics that has become super trendy, hasn't it, in recent years? When I was at school, which, I mean, to be honest, that wasn't recent years. Long time ago, right? Long, fairly long time ago. Um, there, there was, this topic wasn't up for debate. If anyone came in and sort of decided they were a bit of a tomboy or whatever it was, then, you know, fine, let them get on with it. But this whole argument that kids need a safe space, they need the freedom and the room to be able to explore their genders and their sexualities, I mean, is that right? Or is that potentially quite harmful to children with plastic minds? It's harmful and I think one of the most important things about this guidance is that it doesn't talk about trans children, it talks about gender questioning children. Um, it, it doesn't tell schools to accept that if a child uh, feels unhappy about their sex that the school should treat them as the opposite sex. And that's what's been going on in schools now uh, for several years, as Serge said, because they haven't had good guidance from the government. They've had guidance from activists and activist teachers. But, but Maya, as I was saying to Serge, do you agree uh, that guidance isn't good enough? Guidance is avoidable. You can ignore guidance, even if it comes from the government. Uh, I think schools need to be told, uh, look, mums and dads raise children, not you. And if a child comes to you with something as profound as I want to change gender, then the school must surely tell parents. Absolutely. But it's not just about mums and dads. You know, there, there are mums and dads who are telling schools that they should treat their child as the opposite sex. Um, and schools need to be, be able to say no to those mums and dads as well. So they need to tell parents if there are any kind of concern about a child's mental health or safeguarding which would include a child um, saying that they feel like they were born in the wrong body or they want to change sex but also schools have to say no to parents that are making these demands on them um, so it's not enough just to pass it on to on to parents parents have to be told but schools have to be able to say no your daughter is not your son. We have safeguarding responsibilities for the other children in this school. Um, and, and this guidance does draw some very clear red lines about, for example, uh, single sex spaces, changing rooms, toilets, sports, where it says uh, the schools must say no. Um, and also schools must always record what sex a child is. They shouldn't forget what sex a child is. Every teacher should know what sex the children um, in their care are. All the way up the, to the, the age problem age being, age. though, Maya, uh, you know, your schools must say no. Well, guidance means they don't have to. Uh, should, so, would you agree that this should be taken into law? There should be a matter of law that schools have to do this. Well, the, I mean, these things are existing laws. Schools are creatures of, of law. Uh, they have to record every child's name, date of birth and sex when they join the school. And this guidance is just reminding schools that they can't change that and they can't pretend to be confused about it. I think where it would be very helpful um, to draw this more tightly into law is in there's there are statutory safeguarding guidance, which are which is statutory. Um, and at the moment, all it says in that guidance um, about gender identity is something that Stonewall put in there, which is it's not a safeguarding concern. Um, and we think that the government should now revise 
the statutory safeguarding guidance to schools and say you should consider this to be a safeguarding concern and you know if a child um develops a cross-sex identity from nowhere this is a this is something to be concerned about not something to celebrate uh, Serge, back to you. I mean, I was saying earlier that when I was at school, this sort of debate wasn't happening. That was sort of in the 90s and noughties. And it seems to me, if you were to plot a graph of the whole debate about gender fluidity and when that kicked off and the prevalence now, I've got a really good mate with four teenage daughters and she says in her daughter's classrooms, about a third of the girls are now saying, well, I'm actually a boy and things like that. That it, there's a direct correlation essentially with TikTok and social media and the brainwashing <coughs> of adolescents by this sort of very very peculiar algorithm driven activism online have you seen well, in your long career this sort of well, phenomenon take off well i'm not sure we call it phenomenon we might look back in 10 years time and consider it grooming you know uh, we've already had our jimmy savile moments where we've looked back and thinking how on earth did we ever let that happen uh, that's why i welcome what's going on maybe you're right kevin it hasn't gone far enough yet but it's better than it was yesterday and now you've got head teachers who may not be bullied by activist groups, you know, with other agendas. So, Alex, quite rightly, these ideas never came into the mind of children. Somebody's put them there. And my worry, and we haven't got much control over social media, that it's adults doing it with alternative agendas. And uh, again, Grooming, recruitment, I don't care what you call it, and I'm too old to care anymore, but someone's going to start protecting our kids. And if we can't do it in schools, we can't do it anywhere. But um, I hope it goes into law, but um, I'm Step so in the right pleased. Direction, right? Yeah. Right. Step in the right direction. Strong and necessary words. Uh, Sir Chefe and Maya Forstad are very uh, good to have you on the show. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you so much. Uh, moving on uh, to another story today, and British holidaymakers may see the end of cheap last-minute travel deals as airlines and ferries face new restrictions on bookings. Yeah, under the EU's new entry-exit system set to launch next October, airlines and ferry companies will have to confirm passengers' travel eligibility at least 48 hours before a flight or a cruise. It will also require Brits to have to have their fingerprints checked and their picture taken when entering Europe. Well, joining us to explain what all of that means is The Sun's travel editor, Lisa Minot. Lisa, I mean, this legislation's been going through the system of the EU for a while and applies to sort of basically all non-EU countries who want to go into the EU. But it is going to potentially be a right headache with lots of countries in the EU saying, oh my goodness, we're going to have queues the length and breadth of the whole nation if we put this in place. Exactly, because this is the entire bloc. And of course, we are one of the busiest borders between um, the EU and Britain. You know, obviously, you've got not just the ferry ports, you've got airlines, and then you've got, of course, the trains as well. And this has the potential to cause devastating chaos. Uh, now, they've delayed it again and again and again. Um, it's now coming into play in October. That was very much because the French said, please don't put it into place while we've got the Olympics on. It could lead to chaos through the Olympics. Um, but it is going to involve huge amounts of extra admin for airlines and extra time if you're trying to go through in a ferry port um, or on a train. You're going to have to spend at least five or seven minutes having your um, biometric um, sort of picture of your eyes and your fingerprints. That's going to take a lot of time. At the moment, they can transfer people through the terminals. <coughs> We saw what happened even after Brexit in terms of having to have the passport stamp. That increased it from about 30 seconds to a minute. This is going to be five or seven minutes per passenger. And that is going to lead to total chaos when we come to the likes of our ports. Again, as you say, for the airlines, having to give those details 48 hours in advance means that you can no longer just rock up at an no airport last minute flight, and yeah. buy a ticket. So lowlastminute.com. The booze cruise industry, people yeah. just, you know, heading over to France on a whim to go and spend some money in the EU. We're trying to spend our money in the EU, and that is going to be really difficult. What's your feeling about why this is happening? I mean, my uh, speculation earlier today was uh, this is just the EU uh, punishing us uh, for leaving their club. 
Um, I, I wouldn't say it's just about us. Well, this was to, about, tell them, please it's, explain. It's, in their eyes, it's about security. It's about the fact that they're trying to make sure that it's going to be much more secure for um, the EU to sort of guard against the sort of the immigration that's coming in or illegal immigration, whatever. That's their idea. Of course, because we have one of the busiest borders between mm. the EU and the outside world, um, we are going to be the ones that are really going to suffer. Now, at this the This is ports, dysfunctional, though. This, this is dysfunctional. I mean, it's all very well to say, oh, we've got to keep Europe safe, we've got to keep Britain safe, we've got to keep the rest of Europe safe, but this isn't going to work. What's the point of that? And it's also not going to work for these huge industry, which is the huge cruise liners that are going around the Med at the moment. Now, they would have every yeah. nationality on board. They would have people on board who are Americans, they're going to be Japanese or whatever. Now, when they get landed a port in the EU now, how are you going to process 5,000 people off a ship <laughs> next door to another ship with 4,000 people on it? So let's um, think about that. It's 5,000 times seven minutes, isn't oh, yeah. it? That's but a lot of time. Very, very briefly, I mean, you know, this is borders coming back into fashion because of the levels yes. of inward migration. But we don't actually put the same uh, onus on passengers from the EU coming to Britain, do we? Um, not at the moment, no, but that we are, we do actually have plans ourselves to have a similar type of scheme. And we already have one to an effective degree in the terms of the e-gates that you see um, at the airports. They can be used by EU passengers. We can use the e-gates in the EU at the moment as well. And that's not to say that we've also now got another thing that's going to be coming in. It's not just going to be this entry exit system. Um, about six months after that, they will be bringing in a visa. So similar mm. to the visa that you have to get to go to the States, there will be a visa to go to Europe as well seven euros going to last you two years until your passport expires so again it's going to be another layer of um, sort of administration another layer of bureaucracy but on top of that it's going to be something else that I think is going to be really difficult for Brits to get their head around when we've never done it before uh, Lisa, Lisa thank my you. not uh, travel editor of the Sun thank you very much for joining us so coming up after the break more reaction to that emotional interview with Dame Esther Ranson's daughter on her calls to legalize assisted dying I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and I'm Alex Phillips and you are with talk TV on TV on radio online and on your smart speaker Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. The Covid inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilch. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass, <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative government are not conservative. Why don't you leave that party and come to one that actually shares uh, your ideologies? This has been a party political broadcast uh, on behalf no, of I the don't. Reform UK party. Hi, I'm Ofcom. Just, just... Kids think all they have to do is take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok. Problem solved. 
This is really unfair. What's, what, what's unfair? If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. So yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yes, because I cannot continue my work. When I say I am God, I'm not joking. Did you feel Elvis was controlling? I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Are you prepared you. to call is Hamas possible, a terror group? Is it possible to have a rational you can't, discussion can you? with you? I've asked you two questions. Should Hamas stay in power and are they a terror group? You're refusing to answer either of them. They've that won't. is very telling. Talk TV, it's the only place where you get the truth. You've done a book on poetry. Poetry and music for the many. I love poetry, we can agree on that. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. And we are joined now uh, by the great Mike Graham uh, to give us a little taster ahead of his show, The Independent Republic of Mike Graham, which is, of course, on Talk TV tonight at 9 Some p.m. Must watch. Welcome, uh, Mike. Uh, uh, before you tell us uh, what uh, you've got coming up tonight, uh, we've sort of stumbled upon uh, what is clearly a massive story because Esther yeah. Ranson has announced she uh, wants to go to Dignitas to organise the end of her own life. We had her daughter on, Rebecca, in a very moving interview earlier. Uh, what is your, my, my, our belief is it's just ridiculous. You know, I, I, it's my life. If I want to end it, it's got nothing to do with Parliament or politicians. Uh, they shouldn't, you know, they should stick out of my life and stick out of my death as far as I'm mm. concerned. 80% uh, of people want us to be allowed to make decisions about how, how to end our own lives. Where do you stand on this? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I mean, we, we saw the story last night on uh, on the front pages and, and, and we followed it and we, we debated it a little bit last night and most of the people on the panel were with you and said absolutely yes, that's something that we think should happen. Madeleine Grant was with us. She didn't think so. She thought it was um, a step too far. And I can understand people who say, well, you know, there's lots of unscrupulous characters out there. You know, some of them might take advantage, but surely there must be some way of safeguarding that. You know, it seems to me that it's not something that's going to happen en masse, is it? I mean, it's not like loads of people are suddenly going to go, oh, I think I'll go to Dignitas uh, because now I can, because before it was illegal. I think there is definitely something to be said for, for those who are suffering, for those who are you know, in pain, and those who do not wish to live anymore, they ought to be able to, to make a, a, a rational decision to end their own lives. I mean, obviously, it's different if the person involved is perhaps, you know, incapacitated, not able to make that decision. But the, the courts could, could allow for that. You could have a system whereby, if that was the case, you could apply for permission to do it. You know, yeah. it doesn't seem to me to be without um, any kind of rule at all, that you, can, that you can just rule it out and say nobody can do it. You know, my mother died recently. You know, if, if she had lived to a point where she was in pain, where she was suffering, and she didn't want to be around anymore, I would t t totally take her to Dignitas if that was what she wanted me to do. You know, absolutely no question. And I know for a lot of people, they wouldn't risk breaking the law. But you're right, you know, we're big enough, I think, to take responsibility for such things. And, and you know, there are nasty and horrible, unscrupulous people in the world who will do all sorts of things. doesn't mean that nobody else should be allowed to. Absolutely, yeah. Mike. Very quickly, what's coming up on your show? What else have you got? Well, the lovely Sadiq Khan's back in the news, isn't he? Because he seems to have become um, sponsored by United Airlines. This is a guy who flies around the world uh, talking about climate change and making sure that we uh, get to net zero as fast as possible. We don't drive any cars. He appears to have done some kind of dodgy deal with United Airlines. Not that he benefited personally from it, but he was able to take some journalists with him. He was able to take some aides with him to New York, uh, to Argentina, um, all thanks to gas-guzzling American Airlines. I mean, it's all a bit odd. Mike, Thanks, thank Mike. you ever so much. Remember, tune in to watch The Independent Re Republic of Mike Graham tonight at 9 o'clock. You don't want to miss it. He is one of the most treasured beasts of talk TV. He, he's the heart of the... What do I, he's, he's the heart and soul. If he's the heart... If you're the Keith Richards, what's Mike? Yeah, yeah. No, he's the heart and soul of talk TV. That's what he is. Right. Well, as we mentioned earlier, we spoke to Esther Ranson's daughter, Rebecca, who told us about her mother's situation. Um, if you've met my mum, she doesn't come to decisions lightly and she doesn't change her mind. So by the time we heard about it, it was intractable law in our house. But she has always said that she wants to have a dignified life and a dignified death. And the process of dying 
replaces and supersedes your family's memories if it's a terrible death. Uh, and you've been calling us up on this issue. Elizabeth from Herefordshire is on the line. Hello, Elizabeth. Uh, what would you like to say? Hi. Um, yes, um, one of the previous callers on this said, oh, there is assisted diet, you know, with morphine. But my mother had um, a rare cancer. It was bile duct cancer. And even though she did have morphine in the hospital... She was still in pain. That pain of the cancer overrode the drug. And I'll never forget her saying, um, God help me, Elizabeth, can you ask for more? We did. And we were told, we're at the legal limit. We can't give any more. And she had to wait over another hour and now 10 minutes. Now, there was no way she was going to get up out of the bed and walk out. And they wouldn't have, uh, you know, they wouldn't have been shortening her life uh, any great deal. Would they, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't have been prolonging her agony either. And um, this was in 2007. So, um, not saying it's the government, but with the policy makers, 2007, Labour, Tory now, it doesn't matter who's in, and I wouldn't wish it on anybody. But if they were able to sit by the bedside someone like that, and, and she wouldn't have been the only one, um, and witness her going through that agony wow. at the fact that they weren't at the legal limit. The policy makers need to sort of adjust that level because she didn't have a dignified death in the end. And and as another caller after after the previous one said, you, w you wouldn't allow your, your dog to go through that. We've had dogs, we don't prolong their agony if they're suffering like that. It's not helping them in any way. And it's, it's one of the abiding memories I have of my, my mother lying there in hospital and I couldn't help her and the powers that be couldn't administer any more morphine. But the cancer pain overrode that, that drug. It wasn't sufficient. So it well, wasn't that's, that's something there. else that so we need to look at as well, Elizabeth, I think. Uh, uh, I'm really sorry that you had to go through that. But once again, I mean, it just seems that common sense seems to disappear in this area. Oh, Your mother should have been difficult. helped. Yeah. Your mother should have been helped. Uh, thank you very much thank for the call. Thank you. Uh, we can now speak to Martin, who's in London. Hi, Martin. Hello. Hi. What are you you, what's your view on this really difficult topic? Well, uh, my view is my mum passed in 2020, but what happened, she had... Um, 15 years previously, she had dodgy kidneys, she was on a dialysis machine, and then 15, then what happened, the doctors rang up and said they got a kidney, so she had a kidney transplant, um, and the doctor said it's got a good 10 years in the kidney, so she laughed and said, no, that's fine. And true to the word, when she became about 74 years of age, that kidney she had packed up. Um, so what happened, because obviously in hospital they couldn't do nothing for her anymore, so they sent her home to die. But she took eight months to die. So if you know about it, if you haven't got kidneys, you're, you're slowly, your body's slowly poisoning yourself. Oh. So it's inevitable that she was going to die, it was guaranteed, right? But it also, it, it, it gave her, dement like she had slight dementia, then she had senile dementia, right? So... Your call, your calls previous were saying like of sound mind, she would have been, she would have agreed to assisted death, but because she had dementia, like anyway, what I'm getting at is she was guaranteed to die. She was in severe pain. The last two months was horrendous for her. Oh. Really, oh. really, so you, really. You see, bad. Martin, I mean, you should have been able to make that decision uh, for you. Yeah, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. But would I have been a lad? I knew my mum. Obviously, I'm my mum. My mum was an avid believer, if it's in pain, put it to sleep, you know. If it's suffering, yeah. end it, yeah. you know. Yeah, I, I, so all of the, in all these areas, we need to change, start changing the law and you should have been able to make that decision for your poor mum. Uh, yeah. Once again, I'm very sorry you had to go through this and thank you very much for your call. Well, joining us now is Dr. Mark Pickering, who's the Chief Executive of the Christian Medical Fellowship. Uh, thanks for joining us. I mean, we've heard so many people call in and give all sorts of anecdotes and analogies that are really, you know, upsetting and disturbing when you hear of the suffering people have endured, both personally and on behalf of their loved ones, when actually, uh, in many respects, a quicker death would have been more humane. But it's a very difficult subject, isn't it? Who has the right to take a life and whether it does open the door to perhaps unscrupulous practices. We were just hearing there from a caller who, whose mother was sent home to die. It took eight months. And then you think, well, if this was put in the hands of the NHS, might they want to expedite that? Because actually it's less of a burden 
on the system? I mean, these are the big questions that need to be answered. Absolutely. And uh, I think you mentioned there about you should have been able to make that decision. If we put in the hands of relatives about when their elderly relatives should die, well, you know, what if that if the people have got an inheritance coming? What if they're just overburdened and exhausted with caring for them? We've got to take it. We, we can't just give it to relatives and say it should be your um, your decision. And, and somebody said earlier that there's a legal limit of morphine. There isn't a legal limit of morphine. Good palliative care can titrate morphine or other drugs. There are various other end-of-life drugs that can be used in, in analgesia. And the vast majority of situations when there's good pain control in place, it makes it significantly better. So there, there's massive um, misunderstandings often about particular situations. We mustn't take one story of one bad death, which could quite possibly have been different had it been managed better, and extrapolate that to um, you know, we must change the law because we see in all the countries where the law has been changed, things that were meant to be safeguards, then they become barriers to patient access. People start to push the limits again and again, just like they've done in Canada, where next year they're planning to bring it in for people who have purely mental illness. And I think that's just outrageous uh, that people are seeing that as a right that needs to be brought in to now allow mentally, mentally ill people to commit suicide. What kind of society do we want? Uh, Mark, uh, don't take this wrong, but if uh, Dame Esther Ranson wants to die with dignity, wants to uh, protect her family for watching her die without dignity, who are you to tell her that she can't? I'm not telling her she can't, but she's asking for the law to change. And as soon yeah, well, as who she are you to say change that that the law... law well, Parliament is that is the one that says that, and Parliament is the one that looks at all of the unintended consequences. Dame Esther Ranson is a lovely lady, I'm sure, but she's already said that she thought she wouldn't make her birthday in June, then she thought she wouldn't make Christmas. She's on a particular treatment. She has really no idea when the end of her life will approach, and nor do we. And she simply said, I'd like to buzz off to Dignitas perhaps when the time comes. She said that you know, that would cause conflict with her family, her daughter said she liked to ground the plane. It's not something that her daughter is wanting. And um, what you're actually giving there is, is someone who already has an incredibly large amount of autonomy, yet more choice and autonomy. What about the people who really don't want to feel any pressure to end their lives? Once you change the law for the Esther Ransons and the professionals and the people who have lots of autonomy, then you put a duty on the health service to provide that and offer that to other people, many of whom are not used to making these choices, many of whom feel vulnerable, uh, maybe being a burden on their family. And then it doesn't become a choice, it becomes a duty to die. And do you really want to be in a situation when elderly, infirm, poor people with English uh, as a second Craig language. Mark, thank you very much. Uh, I should Thank be you very much. We have to go now. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, sadly, uh, we have come to the end of what's been an informative and moving show. Thank you for tuning in and for all of your texts and calls. Please do join us same time tomorrow. Yeah, up next, of course, though, is Ian Collins. It's goodbye from us and have a very good afternoon. Ever feel like you're not part of the conversation? That you're not getting the full picture on the important issues. Or the stories that impact your life. Jim, who was on at the last hour waiting a year for a heart operation, blew us out the water. Well, at Talk TV, we cover the issues you care about. I would love to give the nurses a massive pay rise. Give them one, then. With proper debate and argument, we tell it how it really is. And have some fun along the way. Talk TV for the stories that matter. Thanks for joining us. You're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online. We're on your smart speaker as well. Criminals using XL bully dogs as weapons to threaten others. No matter how well trained, most dog owners will tell you a dog can turn. Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. I rather like David Cameron. I don't sort of bear him any ill will because he delivered the referendum that he said he would deliver. The Tories love a scrap. You can almost see this coming round the tracks with Suella Braverman. She's heading up one side and Rishi soon at the other. The police are pro-Palestine. That is just not right. You swear an oath in the police to act without fear or favour. 
The COVID inquiry seems to have turned into a sort of pantomime. There's not really any substance to it. It's hard to know whether it's a farce or a tragedy. For the amount of time it's taken, the number of illegal migrants currently sent by us to Rwanda, zilt. The amount of money it's cost, we're saying, what are we saying it's cost? About 140 million. 140 million pounds so far. So 140 million pounds, so far result, nil, absolutely nil. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google? Where is our unbiased news going to come from? Calais in winter is cold. <laughs> <laughs> that is from the Jeremy Corbyn book. Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. If you're walking towards me and you're a vegan, you should have a great big orange sticker over here saying, watch out, vegans about. The weirdest plank that we've had in, what, yeah. three years? Hundreds and hundreds of mice in a box, which he walks into a branch of McDonald's. McMouse Man. McMouse Man, yeah. McMouse Man. He should be easy enough to catch this guy, shouldn't he? I mean, he's got a house full of mice. He's on <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> This is a major summit. President Biden decided this was important after watching a Tom Cruise film. Sunak and the current Conservative